there's at least one interesting outcome of what happens when pure breeding individuals are crossed to produce F1s that are themselves crossed to produce an F2 generation. And this is a concept called Hardy Weinberg, named after two scientists, equilibrium. And this was a feature of crosses, not just this cross design, but all crosses, that was discovered years after Mendel set up his initial crosses between those homozygous pure breeding yellow peas and the pure breeding green peas producing heterozygous offspring. And then an F2 generation in which the green phenotype reappeared. So we know that all of the individuals that are green are homozygous for the recessive allele. And then for the yellow peas, two different genotypes, as we just saw, can produce the same phenotype. So of those peas, there will be some that are homozygous capital Y, like that. And there will be more that are heterozygotes. And we've seen that generally these occur in a particular ratio based on Mendelian inheritance that the homozygous capital Ys will occur once for every two heterozygotes for every one homozygous little y. Now, Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is this principle that if you look at the number of alleles, not genotypes, but the individual alleles or versions of genes in every generation, they will stay the same. In other words, in this example I've just drawn out, we could look at the number of capital Ys and lowercase Ys in each generation, count them up, and the frequency or the ratio or the percent should stay the same in each generation. That is the prediction of the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So in this case, let's start with the P0 generation. We've got two capital Ys and two lowercase Ys in the parents. And then we look at the F1 generation. In the individuals that participated in this population, in this cross design, there are still two capital Ys and two lowercase Ys. And now we turn our attention to the F2 generation as a whole. How many capital Ys are there? We can count them individually. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. And if we look at the number of lowercase y's, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen we see that every generation, the frequency doesn't change. There are an equal number of capital Ys and lowercase Ys in each generation. And this pattern isn't specific to this specific cross. Whatever sort of cross you start with, the initial frequency of capital letters and lowercase letters, or however you're defining the different alleles, should stay the same each generation. And then you should ask me about what I mean when I say should stay the same. So let's step back for a second and look again at these generations of this cross. We have two individuals with pure breeding genotypes that initiate this cross and then produce two heterozygous individuals that are mated together to produce the F2 generation. Now, if this was, for example, happening in nature, what would happen to the F2 generation if all of a sudden there was some sort of a predator that was introduced? That looks like a menacing predator. 
great. And the only peas that were yellow had some sort of a chemical defense, say a smell or a bad tasting chemical, that protected them from being eaten or disturbed by this new predator. What would that do to the allele frequencies as we move from the P0 generation to the F1 generation to the F2 generation? In this case, what's happened is one of the two alleles is relatively less helpful or less beneficial, or in another sense, one of the alleles is more detrimental to the pea plants. So in the first generation, everything is the same because this happened before the introduction of this pest. So at the start of the cross, we had an equal number of capital Ys to lowercase Ys, and in the F1 generation, there was the same number of capital Ys and lowercase Ys. But now let's see what happens when we see that this pest actually destroys or eats some of the individuals in the population before we get a chance to observe them. That is to, for example, collect the peas and see what their phenotype is, that they're green, or to measure their genotype. So in this case, if this pest destroys all the organisms that have the bad phenotype, so to speak, let's look at what alleles are left in the individuals that survived for us scientists to observe them. Just as we saw before, some of these individuals will be homozygous, capital Y, and some will be heterozygotes. But if you're yellow, you have to have one capital Y allele. So we'll still probably see the prediction that Mendelian inheritance and the Punnett score would predict, which is that we'll see some capital Y over capital Y plants, and we should see, on average, about twice as many heterozygotes. But what happened in this case is that all of the homozygotes, the lowercase y over lowercase y plants, or peas, have been destroyed. So let's see what happens now when we calculate allele frequency. Is this population still in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Did the number of Ys, capital and lowercase, stay the same from generation to generation? In this case, now we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 capital Ys. And what we should expect is, because all those green plants were destroyed green peas, that were the homozygous recessives, we're not going to see as many lowercase y's as we had in the past. So let's count. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Now we've got a shift in the frequency of capital y's relative to uppercase, or lowercase y's to uppercase y's. In previous generations, they had been the same, but now we see a shift. There's fewer lowercase y's than we expect by chance. This population is no longer in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And what that tells geneticists, when they go out and sample individuals in a population, generation after generation, and all of a sudden they see a shift in the frequency or the relative amount of one allele versus the other, is that tells the geneticists that there is some force or factor acting on a particular allele that's making it become less prevalent or more prevalent in the population. In other words, this sort of a calculation can tell geneticists 
for a particular environment in a particular situation for a particular species, which allele is, for all intents and purposes, better than another allele? Now let's look at a real example of how a particular combination of alleles in an actual species is lethal, actually kills the organism if they get the wrong combination of alleles in an organism.